All right, welcome back. Um, I got John Phillips with me out of Jacksonville, Florida. I got I to gotta read this. I like to some of the things. That Robert Shapiro called him the best lawyer in America. The, I don't know why he didn't say the whole world, but best lawyer in America is, is pretty good. Multi-million dollar verdicts. I believe there's one that he had up in the $495 million. I got to be honest with you. That is impressive. Represents celebrities, athletes, bur a board-certified trial lawyer, AV rated in Martindale Hubble. In case you folks don't know what that means, that's the highest level you can get for proficiency, ethics, and professionalism. Uh, he's lectured at TEDx. He's movies guy, TV commentator. You're doing it all, John. Welcome to the show. I need to take you with me when I go places, Bob. That was great. Well, you could take me any time when you're getting those $495 million verdicts, brother. <laughs> that's Collecting excellent. Collecting on the problem. Yeah, so listen, I mean, overall, we, you know, I was just having a, a discussion with my previous guest there. If you're a defense attorney and you're representing the guy, you know, we, I've, I always opine in a police shooting, if you're dealing with a person who's a completely innocent person, you're going to have a much more difficult time in front of that jury than somebody who was up doing something nefarious. And while he didn't follow police protocol um, and he didn't have his uh, vest with him and markings and so on and so forth, clearly can understand how somebody could be scared being approached in that manner. Let, let me just ask you, if it's to be believed that the cop then sees a gun, is there a defense there for him at all, or is that as best as he can at least try to argue for a defense? The, the best thing they can do is kind of try what they've done, which is, which is hide behind the badge. We try federal civil rights cases as well, and, and they're very difficult because jurors are people too. They, they, they want to be protected by police officers. They want to believe that officers are, are in this for the public good, but we've, we've got to regulate the bad 10% of all professions, and Newman Raja fits within that. He, he, he was an aggressive cop, he didn't follow protocol, and he, he, he rightfully faces manslaughter. It probably could have been worse. Well, you know, listen, I, I used to be in uh, 42 U.S.C. 1983 litigator. That's the civil rights statute, uh, federal civil rights statute. And since we normally talk about criminal law here, we have our great true crime people here on the Law and Crime Network in the chat room. Let's take a little divergence there for that civil rights stuff. So you have to show a custom, a practice, a policy of deliberate indifference of the police agency typically to loop the agency in. Have you seen anything in the facts of this case that would show that, uh, either a prior internal affairs record from Beck versus the city of Pittsburgh that talk about a temperamentally unfit officer, things of that nature, that would fit within that rubric of a good civil rights case here, not criminal, civil rights. Right. I, I, know, I know Ben Crump and his team represent, represent uh, Corey's father. We were actually called by the, his, the, his mother's side of the family, uh, but the only survivor in this case was the father. And it's going to be tough against the against the police force. You know, the Manel type type claim is going to be very difficult. Obviously, they do have the state law and federal claims against the officer himself. Uh, he did have some level of disciplinary action in his past. That's something that they'll want to investigate. But that entire matter was stay has been stayed since 2017 waiting to see what a jury does here. Yeah, that's really funny you should say that because we're going to be covering a case on the Law & Crime Network, Jason Carter, where a civil case preceded the criminal charges and the verdict in that civil case will be starting tomorrow actually led law enforcement to charge him criminally. Um, so it's an interesting little juxtaposition there. Hey, but the prosecutor was given some fiery statements in both the closing as well as the rebuttal. Let's take another look. So when, you're li when you listen to that 911 call, think to yourselves, why is he trying to explain to the operator? Yeah, you know, I told him, uh, I gave him commands. Uh, black male wearing all black dreads, had a silver handgun in his right hand, came out. I saw him come out with a handgun. I gave him commands. I identified myself, and he turned, pointed the gun at me, and started running. I shot him. He turned, pointed the gun at me, and started running. So where is the threat? Then he sustains the gunshot wound to that right side of his chest and we know that's the shot that killed him that blew out his heart now you heard expert testimony from both sides you heard from dr juiced and you heard from 
from Dr. Nelson. And Dr. Nelson, why he was so hostile yesterday, I have no idea. But just ask yourselves. Okay, so there we go. Part of the prosecution's closing arguments, as we know, and we witnessed and gone over them early this morning, there was a rebuttal argument that was also extremely powerful. So, you know, John Phillips, if you had to be on one side or the other as a litigator and your goal was to win a case, do you want to take the prosecution's case or the defense case? I, I'm a victim's guy, and so we... we we on this case and on most cases would stand with the prosecution. Uh, and, and, you know, you're showing the best parts, but she, she went about an hour and a half this morning just in the first close and then had a rebuttal. And, and she was passionate all the way from beginning to end, but, but kind of circled back a couple of times. And, and she, she did an effective job, but the defense attorney did a fantastic job. And again, you know, defended based upon the badge, defended not just on the fact that Corey Jones could be a threat to the officer, but an imminent threat to others as well. Uh, and that he was, you know, there's the fleeing felon rule where, where if a felon is fleeing, you can use force. And most say, well, he wasn't committing a felony, he was minding his own business. Well, the assault on a police officer, which is Raha's perspective, was what justified the fleeing felon rule in his mind. So, you know, they've 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 tried to put um, the badge on him, which which we pointed out this morning on on Law and Crime Network. You know, the interesting thing about one of the most interesting things about her, uh, the prosecutor's closing, is she was wearing a badge. If you notice her little lapel pin, uh, she she sent a message to that jury that she's with law enforcement and on the right side of law enforcement during her entire closing. It was a very savvy move. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, listen, uh, true, my staff, we all used to wear those pins as well. We were very proud of them as prosecutors. I appreciate your perspective, John. We're gonna take a quick break. We'll be back with more Law on Crime. Please stay tuned. All right, welcome back. That's the defense summation, arguing about why there may be inconsistencies in Roger's report because of tunnel vision and perception distortion. Now, John, I'm not gonna lie to you. When I was prosecutor, we used to go through a course called Top Gun, where it was a, not a real scenario, but they tried to make it as real as possible. They would videotape it. And the tunnel vision pieces, I watched as people came out of a closet and pointed a gun to the cop's head while he was ordering people to do things in commands. And afterwards, they were like, what about the guy with the gun to your head? And he's like, what are you talking about? And even when he saw it on videotape, could not believe. He's like, no, you, you guys made that up. There is a lot about that. And he, the defense lawyer here bootstraps that with saying that even some of the state's witnesses made minor mistakes in their testimony. It doesn't mean they're necessarily lying but there is a lot to this tunnel vision and distortion perception. Does it sell to a jury? I think so. Uh, I mean, and, and it's logical. I've taken, you know, plenty of officers' depositions, and they do talk about, particularly when they truly believe their life is in jeopardy, that you're focusing on the subject of, of what could take your life. Uh, and, and so it, it does make sense, but also officers generally talk about how time slows down during these instances. And so you've, you've got to reconcile both facts with the inconsistent statements, with the inconsistent evidence, where, where the gun was found. And a jury's got to figure all of that out, which is going to take some time. I imagine they're going to go back through uh, Newman's, Newman's recorded interview as well. Yeah, I, I, I investigated one as the county prosecutor where the cop's version of what happened after the incident uh, was so completely different than what the motor vehicle recording and body cams were picking up. Actually, the motor vehicle recordings and body cams completely exonerated the police officer. But the fact was, you could tell when he was given a statement, he was kind of making things up. He couldn't, and again, if you had saw this video, it was one of the most, it was nationally brought across the entire country. It was almost an impossible split second thing that was going on that I really believe a lot of times he was just trying to fill in the blanks because he himself couldn't even figure out what it was he did that caused him to shoot the guy. Right. 
And, and you see sometimes after these incidents where the the officers will meet with the union reps and attorneys and state attorneys. Uh, it's it's not very often that they wind up subject to criminal proceedings uh, or at least past grand jury stage. So this is a very rare case where the police department and the officer are on opposite sides uh, and prosecutors and the officer are on opposite sides. And so they're going back through and combing through his verbal cues and the inconsistencies and trying to show that there's no reasonable doubt that lives there. Uh, and the defense attorney's job is the opposite, to show, well, th that's not quite what you think it was. And inconsistencies don't, you know, don't necessarily always disfavor our client. Exactly. In fact, you can make the argument that it's overly consistent, that maybe it was overly rehearsed. The defense did some more in their closing statements. Let's take another look. You could even stretch it to say, well, maybe Corey Jones would have been nervous. But you... You can't just pull a gun on somebody if you're nervous. People get approached by strangers all the time. You can't just pull guns on them. And that's the part that gets left out. And that is the key to this whole thing. Culpable negligence is consciously doing an act or following a course of conduct that the defendant must have known, must have known, not even might have known, must have known, or reasonably should have known should have known that getting out of his van was likely to cause death or great bodily harm. And I say to you, that's not proven. While resisting another's attempt to murder him or any attempt to commit an aggravated assault, and an aggravated assault means pointing a deadly weapon at somebody is an aggravated assault. Pointing a deadly weapon at somebody is an aggravated assault. So I'm not going to go into, into reading, re, reading all of it, but Newman Raja was justified if you believe, if you believe that Corey Jones pulled that gun on him and pointed it at him, or even pulled the gun on him and pointed it away from him would have been enough. But if you believe that he pointed the gun at him, it's justified. The use of force is justified, and the state cannot prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it wasn't justified. All right, so, John, this is a good opportunity to give our viewers, many of whom are lawyers and law students and true crime aficionados, especially our great fans in that chat room, a little bit of a wonky uh, look at, at this law. Each state's pretty much the same. They use different terminology. Um, but we were kind of trying to figure out what attempted you know, first degree murder is when you have an actual death. Um, right. Usually the attempt, it means that the act itself wasn't completed in most places. Um, but it's, he said there that it was intended, to, he intended to defend the cause first degree murder, but was prevented from doing it. I'm still a little unclear. If you have clarity for that, let me know, because I can move on to the defense. It, it's, a, it's a real tough, tough claim. I, I, when I was listing the whole trial, I was trying to figure out exactly what made it impossible and it, it i guess it's because the theory is that the first so they they basically had to divide the six shots into two volleys or more and so I, I guess the thought is that the second volley was intended to kill and there was a level of premeditation because there was there was a pause there was time for forethought but that it wasn't completed because it was the first set that actually killed him um is is the best way I can piece that together because it would either be murder or not murder uh, if he intended to fire shots, but it's attempted murder based upon it not occurring. <laughs> so, right. uh, and, and if if we don't understand it, imagine the confusion in the jury room. Right, and and maybe it was explained a little better by the judge, but that is definitely an area as a defense lawyer. If you don't have great facts, you want to argue the convolution of the law itself, especially on cop cases. And I want to go to the defense of self-defense, just so that the folks understand. That's what they call an affirmative defense, John. And once you assert that, because the defendant doesn't have to prove anything or prove their innocence, the state, he was making a big point, has to disprove, essentially, self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. 
And what his argument was, was that him getting out of that vehicle was not something that was intended to cause serious bodily injury. However, when the gun was out, it was necessary for him to self-defend himself in order to prevent death or serious bodily injury. John, unfortunately, I'd love to get your answer to that. I think I'm generally right about that law, but we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Gats, man, we are moving quick at this low crime network. There is a lot going on here. Um, I, I may have some little inside information for you, or, or I'm not completely verifying this, uh, but one of our very own best is, is out there, kind of knows a lot of what's going on on the ground, indicated that it may be, it may be that the alternate jurors were actually released. In other words, they, they weren't just put in a separate place. Um, and that would really bring a very interesting question. In the typical scenario that I've been involved with, John, um, alternate jurors stay there because you never know if a juror gets sick or gets into an accident and they have to bring another alternate juror in and renew deliberations again. Um, so, you know, it would be very uh, difficult for me to imagine why the media would not be able to approach a released juror. Now, maybe they were released, but you may be called to come back. I don't know, but that's a really sloppy procedure to me. They usually put the alternate jurors in an ante room in the courthouse just so that they can't be contacted. What are your thoughts? Florida State Court's different. Uh, mm -hmm. This is where I... I make my living and once you get to a point, so it's 12 in a capital case, it's six in just about every other case. So this was six with four alternates. Once it becomes time to deliberate in Florida, the alternates go, they don't ever come back, they are released. So you have to deliberate with six. Uh, if one doesn't come back, uh, if you have a sickness or some other issue, if the sides agree, to allow a five-person jury, then so be it. If not, it's a mistrial. I, I, that's, that, that's Florida law. That's lunacy to me. I mean, first of all, as a defense lawyer, you're, in my opinion, in my estimation, especially in a case like this, you're never going to agree. Case never gets better for the prosecution the second time around. And, you know, why, would, why wouldn't you just keep the I mean, I, I guess it's the state law. What can I say? But in the other states, and I've been involved in many trials where we've lost two or three jurors, especially a very lengthy trial. And they were replaced by the alternates that were there, ready to go in. The judge gives an instruction. You are to re begin and renew your deliberations from anew so that that new alternate juror has the benefit of all the deliberations of the entire jury. Uh, let me ask you, John, how many cases have resulted in a mistrial because of something like that? It happens. Um, you know, you'll, you'll, the, the question was whether they were going to uh, sequester the jury once they started deliberating here. And I don't know if they ever got an answer to that. I assume they, they decided not to, but that's why they sometimes on these high profile, very lengthy cases will huddle them all up to the, uh, to the hotel so that they can't uh, not return and, and waste a bunch of time. But it, it, it does happen. I've, I've had it. I've had it happen where, but we did agree. It was a civil case. So less stakes, but we did agree to a jury of five, um, I've had a federal case recently where we had six plus two and they all deliberated uh, all eight and we had we had room for two not to come back. But it's, mm. you know, every system's different. But in Florida, they only let uh, the actual jurors deliberate because I guess the theory is you can't even if you want to st restart deliberations, one person will always be on the outside looking in because they'll never share all of the deliberations. Wow, wow, very, very interesting. Okay, guys, listen, just to give you a quick wrap up here, the jury has had their first set of questions. They wanted various items of evidence reproduced to them. And moreover, they went through the verdict, question number three, the jury verdict form that asked to define actual cause as it relates to the first attempted uh, murder uh, charge that uh, John and myself just, just before that was saying was relatively confusing to us. So maybe it is for the jury as well. Ooh, it's getting fascinating here at the Law and Crime Network. Stick with us. I'll be with you here at 3 o'clock. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Okay, so we got a lot of activity going on there in the courtroom. They're playing back some video and audio. It's very difficult to hear. Um, you guys have already heard all this stuff before if you've been following the case. Uh, so, I don't know, John, 
every time something like this happens where a jury comes back and they've asked for a number of pieces of item of evidence, they obviously are very relevant. The walkthrough interview with the police officer that's on trial, the, um, the, the video that CSI took both the night before and the morning, and um, the audio uh, in the case, these are actually objective pieces of evidence. They're very solid pieces of evidence. They're not really subjective to the extent that they don't have a reason or motive to lie or have bias. Uh, but then that question we get back to actually cause in question number three and this attempted first degree murder charge. Sure enough, we were talking about it, John, and sure enough, they got a question about the law on it. So when you're there as a defense lawyer and a prosecutor, you're trying to make sense of, is this good for me or is this bad for me? What are you thinking? Oh, it's there's nothing worse than that jury question because you even if you think you got the case won, you never know what a jury is going to do. And the 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 good thing is for for the three pieces of evidence, the prosecutor specifically asked them uh, and and charged them with an obligation to listen back and listen to the inconsistencies within uh, Raja's statement. Uh, so so that's not crazily a surprise, but. Then you kind of have the, the 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 jury question, which again, we if we're if we're stumped about it, I imagine this jury is uh, what you know what does actual cause mean, and and the judge can't go redefine everything. They've just got to try to say, look, you've got the jury instructions in Florida. Generally, they can take the jury instructions back with them, and you got to. You got to apply the instructions and, and figure out the facts. Yeah, I think this is a really important point to tell our viewers. These jury instructions that the judge gives on the law, which can be very odious, um, are usually uh, prepared by Supreme Court committees of lawyers and judges. And the judges are told pretty much do not go off script with these jury instructions or you could cause reversible error. So it's been my experience that the judges, if you say, well, this case is a little bit different, judge, they do not want to tweak those jury instructions at all. And like you said, a lot of times we, I've laughed. I've sat there and I've listened to the jury instructions for many, many years. And I say to myself, how the heck are regular folks that have never sat on a jury supposed to understand it? And usually, John, they're defining things by using the word, just what you're told not to do in school, to have knowledge. I mean, to know, to be with knowledge, to stick with knowledge. And so when you're getting into attempt and all these different kind of sophisticated laws and a jury comes back and they want to know what does it mean, the judge is really constrained to explain it because they're concerned about creating reversible errors. Same in Florida? It is. Imagine if we had to play Monopoly or chess, but we got the instructions at the end of the game. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's real complex of what we asked uh, jurors to do, but but they've 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 heard all the facts. Now they got to apply facts to the law, and and I really think on the manslaughter charge, once they rehear the statement and some of the other evidence, they're going to be able to work their way through it. Now whether they can agree six nothing is the question, but I'm I'm still stumped on on what they do with with attempted first degree murder. Because you've got to divide this act into two parts, right? Um, and, and it's it's a real tough ask. And, and and we know as prosecutors, or I could tell you certainly one as a homicide prosecutor myself, I do not want there to be confusion as to what the law is. I certainly don't want there to be confusion as to what the facts are, because when you get confusion, that's what we start. We feel at least starts pushing people towards the idea of reasonable doubt. I got two questions for you on top of that. One of which is all. Also, that this is a police officer. Police officer cases are difficult to prosecute, and while he may not have filed protocol or whatever, um, you know, you want to make sure the jury has no confusion when you're asking them to pull the trigger, no pun intended, on a police officer. And my second question to you, if you want to comment on that, is, is it easier for the prosecution to convict with six as opposed to 12? I think it is. You know, it, getting 12 people to agree on a dinner reservation is sometimes um, difficult. Six, uh, we, we've had, we do criminal defense. We do, you know, my main thing is personal injury, wrongful death, and civil rights, but we do both sides of it as well. Um, you know, you only see 12 in Florida in capital sex crimes and capital murder. Uh, this is obviously neither. So, you know, from that end, it, it should be easier to reach a consensus. Again, this is this is different than what we saw, for instance, with Trayvon or, or Jordan Davis, which is the case we 
handled where where you were really focused, the prosecutors were really focused on murder. Um, here they were building their case up from manslaughter, which I don't even think John Guy mentioned the word manslaughter and Trayvon uh, in the George Zimmerman uh, prosecution. So, um, so, yeah, I was going to say in Florida, do uh, does the defense bar often gyrate um, furiously about the idea that they should be raised to 12 as opposed to six? Uh, every once in a while, you'll see a defense bar motion that that seeks to, you know, reestablish the the original constitutional intent uh, of a jury of twelve. And every time that that motion is generally denied, um, you just we're 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 a six six person state. You go right up north, and Georgia's twelve for just about everything. You know, every state's a little different. So and we're I, just. And I, I think since we agree that. It's easier to hang one of 12 jurors. I mean, in other words, it makes a prosecution job. I should say, when I had to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt to 12 people is not an easy thing. To me, it's an easier thing to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt to six people. I'm just curious, if being a civil rights litigator and all your background, ours are very, very similar to one another. Um, you go to Georgia and defendants get a better opportunity, if you will, at trial than in Florida for the same exact crime. Somebody may be convicted and somebody may not. Simply on that fact alone, it just seems a little un unjust to me in some ways. It does, it, you know, but it's, it ultimately comes down to the old state's rights issues. You know, each state is different. And, and in federal court, for instance, the, 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 you've got to convince the alternate sometimes. We deliberated, had a jury deliberate last year and we had a jury of eight, six plus two, but all eight had to reach the verdict. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, even within federal court, within our state of Florida, there's, there's a difference there. And, and I've been asking all of our guests today, because some of these jury issues fascinate me, and I know they have with the chatters that go on our law and crime uh, chat room. Do you feel, have you been experiencing in your own career where alternates, well, ours stay there, so I don't know if you have the same experience. Afterwards, the verdict comes back, and, and the alternates are in shock. They, they, were, they were believing that the jury was going to go a completely different way, but the jury came back completely different than the alternates. And I've had this experience over and over and over again, and I, I always felt it came down to the idea that the deliberative process, with all of them working together, can really affect the individual feelings when they go in there as just individuals as opposed to a collective unit. Absolutely. What happens once they start deliberating? It becomes, you know, a group think in a group environment. And so the, the ones on the outside weren't a part of that. And, and but on the same token, the reason these these four alternates were chased down is because media uh, wants some insight into what were you thinking? Right. Uh, because if they can broadcast what you know, what that person was thinking, it, it you know, the, it, it extrapolates that the others might be thinking the same thing. But in your experiences, you know, m mine's just like it, that you can't always decide a case based upon what the alternate thinks, quite quite the opposite. Well, I I'm going to go on a limb here, John, I and I'm going to ask you first, though. Uh, there's the high charge, there's lesser included offenses, um, and there's obviously a not guilty or a mistrial in the case. What do you think's happened in this case? Compromise verdict, maybe? No, I... I, I I think they're going to convict on manslaughter. I, I truly do. I, I think it was the right charge. I said the same thing in Zimmerman's case. Um, I, I, you know, it's it, they're, they're they're very different cases, but there's a similar thread. Um, and I I think that it, it the compromise may be uh, not finding guilty on the attempted first degree murder. I will say, however, if they find evidence that that Newman Raja covered something up or planted the gun or moved the gun or, right. or was lying. They may, they may give them, they may give the whole kit and caboodle, but I have a feeling it's, it's guilty on manslaughter and, and not guilty or hung on uh, attempted first degree murder. John Phillips, you've done an awesome job. I greatly appreciate it. My time here is done. It's been a pleasure being with you, but we still got more law crime. Stay tuned.